Welcome to this video on John D. and his home at Mortlake. In many circles, D. is seen mainly as an occult figure. Then again, nearly all mathematicians of the 16th century dealt in what we would consider the occult, alchemy and astrology. D. probably went further than most, especially with scrying to communicate with angels. But even this had a scientific research aspect to it in terms of going as deep as possible or as high as possible with natural philosophy. Some of Dee's mathematical endeavors include writing the preface to the first English translation of the elements, lecturing on Euclid to standing room only crowds in Paris, working on calendar reform, editing the mathematical works of Robert Record, using mathematics to study optics, and consulting on navigation for Elizabethan explorers such as Sir Francis Drake. Dee lived most of his adult life in Mortlake, which is about eight miles west of central London and easily reached by train from central London. From the train station, it is a short walk north down Sheen Lane, past the Mortlake Green, and then east on Mortlake High Street, past the old brewery. Nothing remains of Dee's home, but one set of flats that have been built on this property bear the name John Dee House. Here in Mortlake, Dee developed the largest library in England at the time, and what was essentially a research center that was well visited by scholars of the era. One author describes Dee's library as the whole of the Renaissance. Another writer described it as the Scientific Academy of England. This was a very big deal. D was a very big deal. Just beyond the John D. House Flats is a wall that separates this property from the church next door. The wall was here in D's time, and though it has been repaired over the centuries, I can't help but wonder if some of the bricks might date back as far as the Tudor era when Dee lived. Queen Elizabeth I actually stopped by Dee's house, which really says something about her esteem for him as an advisor of hers. As far as I'm aware, monarchs don't visit commoners at their homes. They might visit a noble, wealthy enough to have a sprawling mansion to accommodate them and their retinue in the necessary style. But Dee was a commoner with a humble abode and yet on more than one occasion, she came to him. On at least one of these visits, perhaps more, she stood at the end of this wall between Dee's house and the church to speak with him. The church on the other side of the wall is named for St. Mary the Virgin. This is where John Dee is buried. The church incorporates multiple architectural styles and elements that date back to a variety of eras. One stone has a date of 1407, but I know that the church built on the current site goes back to a decree by Henry VIII in 1543, so this stone may be from an earlier church on a nearby site that was replaced by this building. This stone records the 1543 Henry VIII date, but itself is definitely more recent than that, and so I would say it's probably commemorative. The baptismal font inside the church is the oldest remaining item relating to the church, and it goes back to the 1400s. It's a very interesting place inside and out, and I was pleased to have had opportunity to attend a Tuesday morning service here. Here are more pictures of the exterior on larger and smaller scales. The churchyard is both beautiful and a bit creepy, which I mean in the very best sense of the term. I think I'd feel a little disappointed if a churchyard associated with John Dee wasn't at least a little bit creepy. This churchyard was a finalist in the Best Kept Churchyard competition in 2001, 
and I can certainly see why, even 20 years later. I love the arch. It adds to the mystery of the place and gave me a sense that something magical, or perhaps nefarious, might happen as a result of walking through it. And here, after establishing at the outset that our focus on D is mathematical and not occult, I'm the one being all dark and arcane about things. D was not buried in the churchyard. Rather, he was buried under the chancel inside the church. There is a plaque inside that marks a spot near where he was buried. The exact spot is impossible to determine at this point, partly due to the many renovations over the years, and partly due to the close proximity of the River Thames and how it may have changed things underground over the centuries. You can find the plaque between two windows on the south side. Here we are looking east toward the altar, and then just off to the right of that where these two hatchments caught my eye. There are many informational plaques, posters, and pamphlets in the church. From what I understand, there was a local John D. Society that met here until quite recently. I think this is one of the pamphlets that they produced. This seems to be in a random spot, and I can't help but wonder if there have been events where this has been posted at the end of the wall between the properties. B's property did extend across what is now the Mortlake High Street and all the way down to the bank of the Thames River. There's a walking path near the river and a plaque there with information about John D. It mentions that Queen Elizabeth came by river or on horseback to visit him. At these times, she would have been staying at her palace in nearby Richmond. You can get to Richmond quite quickly by hopping back on the train. It's only about a 10 minute trip, but more on Richmond when I do a video on Dee's royal connections. Actually, I do have a little bit more to say about his relationship with Queen Elizabeth I here. At one time, Dee petitioned the queen that he be granted the mastership of the Hospital of St. Cross in Winchester which is an almshouse rather than what we think of today when we use the word hospital. Bee's home in Mortlake had belonged to his mother and he had extended it by purchasing more property and building more buildings on it, but it was tight quarters for a growing family and those who served them, as well as an extensive library, an alchemical laboratory, and a scientific academy hosting visiting scholars. The St. Cross Hospital was much larger, which would provide housing for learned men and assistants, and it was near glass houses where instruments for Dee's work could be manufactured and where Dee could have overseen that work. Sadly, despite the esteem in which Elizabeth held Dee, his petition was not granted. Unlike the Mortlake property, the Hospital of St. Cross seems to me to have changed very little since Dee's day. I felt a closeness to Dee as I visited here because of how well preserved it is and because I know he desired to make this his home. Not just the buildings, but also the surroundings feel largely unchanged. So as I looked out over the landscape, I imagined that this is what Dee's eyes would have looked out upon had he been granted this. But back to Mortlake for now. I sure wish I could time travel to see what this was like in Dee's day and to visit that huge library with its wealth of books and manuscripts and to be able to talk with Dee and get a better idea myself of this enigmatic figure.